Today, Ali Torgamani will be presenting about Wolderly IPSCs as a coronary artery disease resource. Ali received his PhD in biomedical sciences from UC San Diego School of Medicine in 2008. He is currently the director of genome informatics and drug discovery at the Scripps Translational Science Institute. Without further ado, allow me to introduce Ali. Uh, hi everyone, so I'm going to be talking about the, our Welderly resource. Uh, <coughs> so first, first, just a very brief, I kind of talked about this before last time, but a brief reminder of what the Welderly resource is, uh, a proposal for how we can use it in the BD, BD2K uh, project, and then I'll uh, get into one of the projects coronary artery disease projects and that we've been working on with the Welderly uh, individuals looking at the function of uh, the 9021 uh, risk loci. So just to remind you, the Welderly cohort is a cohort of about 1,500 or 1,600 individuals uh, now that are 80 years old or older and have reached that age with no common chronic uh, condition. So some of the inclusion criteria uh, is shown here. There's, there's some some diseases like basal cell carcinoma, for example, stuff like that that they can have. Um, but in general, they shouldn't have any uh, diseases. And then we have some sort of limited clinical phenotypes uh, on them as well. Here's the demographics of the cohort. Uh, average age about 83 uh, years old. Uh, they're skewed toward females, similar to the US population at this age. Also skewed towards females, but not quite as uh, bad as a skew, but pretty, pretty close. Uh, they weigh less. They are, they smoke just as much, if not a, a more than the general U.S. population, and this is, this is based on U.S. population of individuals 70 uh, plus uh, years old. Exercise more and are more highly educated. So we did uh, some preliminary analysis to see if there's uh, anything special about the elderly at all. You could, you can imagine that uh, you know, it could just be a kind of stochastic process where some people happen to just make it to that age without any any diseases and there's nothing really special about them at all. It's just, they're just the end of a distribution. So uh, what we did to look at that possibility is look at their, the siblings of the elderly who are not part of the cohort uh, itself and see whether or not there's any survival advantage in the siblings versus um, uh, the general population. So we did this uh, survival analysis here against the uh, Social Security actuarial study for 1920s uh, birth cohort uh, using the life, their life table to generate the Cohort for the US, or the survival curve for the U.S. population in the red, and then the elderly uh, in the blue, and you see there's a significant, uh, very significant increase in survival in the elderly in the in sort of middle ages. So they don't necessarily live any longer than uh, uh, you know the average person born in the 1920s, but it, between the ages of you know 40 and 80 or so, uh, they tend to survive uh, more more often or more frequently, suggesting there's some something shared, anyways, between the siblings and and uh, the elderly core. It doesn't necessarily mean there's a genetic component, but you know, a genetic or behavioral or environmental some some shared uh, characteristic that makes them survive longer than the average person. So. Seems to be something uh, 
special about them. The genomic resources uh, that we have, we're kind of putting together uh, right now, still going through the through the process of cleaning it up so that you can actually do statistics on the data, which is a, not a small problem. Uh, uh, we're using the complete genome, so we, we have 500 individuals, about 550 actually, sequenced on the complete genomics uh, sequencing platform, and then 200 on the Illumina sequencing platform that are phase genomes, and 100 of those 200 uh, overlap. And we're currently um, kind of exchanging information with uh, Andrew's myvariant.info group on these to get some allele frequency information from the well-lily cohort in, into there, and then also using their their kind of functional annotation information to uh, to display in our own portal, uh, similar to the exome aggregation consortium portal or the NHLVI exome sequencing project uh, portal, if you're familiar with those, but some a queryable interface anyways, where you can go in and query for different variants uh, or, or genes, et cetera, and see uh, what are the type and frequency, et cetera, variants that you see um, in this cohort. So that's being put, put together. Also, we have genotyping on about 1,000 uh, individuals, but that had been done a long uh, while ago. So <clears throat> in addition to the uh, genomic data, we are generating iPSCs from these individuals in part for the 9P, 9P21 study that I'll describe uh, in a few slides, and uh, in part just as a, as a resource um, to kind of disseminate and bank these cells and, and have them as a resource that's usable for anyone. So for the ones that we have lined up uh, to reprogram where we have whole genome sequencing data. This is the current uh, status, so about 11 lines that have been reprogrammed, sorry, 11 individuals, and there's multiple lines per individual, about three lines per individual. 11 individuals who have iPSCs that have been reprogrammed and carry types, and sure there's no kind of chromosomal abnormalities that occur during the reprogramming process, so 11 of those. 16 other individuals who have been reprogrammed but not karyotyped, and then there's about 37 uh, others that are in the queue to be reprogrammed, uh, all of which have whole genome sequence data associated uh, with them. So my thought was to use uh, this, this cohort, and we discussed uh, with Andrew as well, use this cohort to build a resource for coronary artery disease specific cell types where you can combine uh, genetic information with expression information and proteomics inter information and make that um, accessible and queryable via the web. Something similar to the GTEx uh, browser, if you're all familiar uh, with that, this GTEx browser has a large number of um, individuals who have multiple tissue samples. You see the total sample number there in the bottom left is about 7,000 samples across a large number of different uh, tissues. And then you can go into this browser and look at, say, the expression of, of genes across, uh, the relative expression of genes across different tissues, or more interestingly, uh, expression quantitative, quantitative trait loci, so SNPs that influence the expression of of a uh, gene based on the genetic plus sequence data. We could generate something uh, similar to that and, and have it paired with uh, GWAS hits, for example, so you can look, start doing hypothesis uh, generation. The, the opportunity here is if you look at the GTEx tissues, they don't have any of the kind of what I would consider the primary besides immune cells or macrophages, uh, the primary coronary artery, artery disease relevant tissues, endothelial cells and smooth blood cells are not present uh, 
in GTEx. There are a couple uh, data sources out there for endothelial uh, cells, but it's you know it's pretty limited. This is the only study that I could um, that I could find. It's actually out of UCLA from Jake Lucas's uh, group. They have 147 human aortic endothelial cells sampled and sequenced, but this was generated a while ago. So it's array data plus chip uh, genotyping uh, data that they have. And he has a queryable interface on his uh, website as well, but it's pretty not great. Um, then uh, the in terms of smooth muscle cells, there's the only thing I could find is this stage um, study, and it's not really smooth muscle cells. It's 66 arterial wall sample, so maybe a mixture of, uh, of cells. So it doesn't seem like there's a smooth muscle cell um, resource out there uh, at all. And this is just kind of recapping uh, the kind of the, the proposal here where we have IPSC lines, differentiate them. I think the, the more interesting thing would be to differentiate them uh, towards smooth muscle cells rather than endothelial cells since there's that large data set of endothelial cells that already exist, and we're actually already doing smooth muscle cell differentiation anyways, which I'll get into next. Differentiate them to smooth muscle cells and do RNA-seq proteomics, couple that with the genetic data and the GWAS hits that we know of to generate a portal where you can do sort of hypothesis generation for GWAS SNP by differential gene expression or differential proteomic uh, expression, et cetera, queries. So with that, I'll talk about what we've actually done with uh, these cells, with the elderly cohort, and uh, differentiating them to smooth muscle cells and, and looking at the influence of this particular uh, genomic locus, loci 9P21, which you all may recognize as the, uh, the kind of loci that has the greatest risk in terms of common disease for coronary artery, artery disease as well as um, uh, dissections, uh, aortic dissection. Um, so it seems to be, you know, either an endothelial or smooth muscle uh, type phenotype, but there's no genes uh, really nearby. There's a CDKN2B is I can't remember how far away it is, but it's pretty pretty far away, and the risk loci don't don't seem to um, really influence CDKN2B. There's there's a lot of debate about whether it does or does not influence CDKN2B uh, expression, but at least if it does, it seems to be cell type specific. So that's that's why getting the coronary artery disease relevant tissue uh, is important. So. For 9P21, what we've done to dissect the, the function of that region is to, for now, knock it out and see uh, what happens with knockouts, with the ultimate idea being that we would actually replace the loci. It's a 60 kb region that we're knocking out uh, and try to generate isogenic lines uh, that have this 9P21 locus swapped out. But swapping in 60 kb region is not easy. So for now, we're just looking at the knockout. Here's the workflow that we have. We're using fingers or talons. We started this a while ago, so started with zinc fingers first uh, to knock out, do single cell cloning, and then have a PCR uh, test for picking heterozygous and homozygous uh, knockouts of this region. Uh, pretty good, pretty good efficiency with. Uh, these two talons that we've uh, designed, we can get about 10% uh, homozygous knockouts, uh, for example, with this with this first talon. Uh, and that's that's uh, the kind of PCR results of the knockouts are shown above. So with the with the knockouts, what we started with 
is to look at uh, whether or not knocking out a homozygous deletion of the risk risk or non risk non risk uh, line has any different influence on you know cellular characteristics or or gene expression so uh, it gets a little complicated the nomenclature especially so just to orient you individual in red if I show individuals in red or bars uh, in red, that belongs to the individual that is risk risk, and then I will refer to them as risk risk wild type if they're not a knockout or risk risk knockout if it's the knockout homozygous knockout of the risk risk uh, locus. Similarly, in green is our welderly. Uh, individual who is non-risk, non-risk, so non-risk, non-risk, wild type refers to a kind of parental line for this indi individual, whereas non-risk, non-risk knockout would refer to the homozygous knockout line from the non-risk, non-risk individual. So these individuals are kind of extremes at the spectrum, right? So we have a welderly individual with no uh, coronary artery disease and uh, homozygous non-risk at 9p21 and comparing that to IPSDs and smooth muscle cells derived from an individual from our gene heart cohort which is a cohort of individuals with coronary artery, artery disease and this person was risk risk at uh, 9p21 and all, all the comparisons are done for on three different independent um, experiments, about four lines per individual and two different talons for the knockouts uh, to account for you know, any off-target effects or anything like that uh, of the talons. So first, when you knock out 9P21 and look at it in IPSCs, there does not appear to be any influence or no obvious impact of 9P21 knockout on on uh, IPSC fidelity, for example. They look pretty much uh, identical uh, in terms of staining for pluripotency markers and, and uh, growth, uh, et cetera. Doesn't, doesn't seem to be any effect on the IPSC. So what we then went on to do is differentiate IPSCs to smooth muscle cells and uh, see what the influence of 9P21 knockout of the uh, risk or non-risk uh, alleles is on, on smooth muscle cells. So this is the, the kind of protocol for smooth muscle cell um, differentiation. And what we'll be looking at first is just cell proliferation, where at each of these different time points, we would replate equal numbers of cells and then measure the number of cells at a later time point to, to get at uh, if there is a proliferation uh, defect or a change in proliferation rate at kind of what cell type does this proliferation uh, change occur at. Is it smooth muscle cell progenitors versus mature smooth muscle cells? So <clears throat> when we knocked out the risk-risk locus and compare proliferation of smooth muscle cell and smooth muscle cell progenitors to the wild type line or the line, the parental line for the risk-risk loci, you see that knockout of the risk-risk Locus leads to a, a, a deficiency in proliferation. So knocking out risk risk reduces cell prolifer proliferation rate, and that cellular prol proliferation rate dif difference starts in smooth muscle cell uh, progenitors. So at day three, even we can see a defect in proliferation. In contrast, when you knock out the 
non-risk, non-risk loci, there's no influence on proliferation either at in smooth muscle cell progenitors or uh, or in mature smooth muscle cells. And that, that's not shown here, but there's there's no defect in, in smooth muscle mature smooth muscle cells either. So proliferation rates about even for the parental non-risk non-risk line versus the uh, or the wild type non-risk non-risk line versus the knockout uh, non-risk non-risk line. If you look at that together, uh, there's a significant, uh, definitely a significant difference where it actually looks like the risk risk knockout is similar to non risk non risk wild type or non risk non risk wild type, whereas the risk risk uh, wild type lines or the lines that actually have the risk risk loci have uh, an incre are relatively increased rate of cellular proliferation relative to the other lines, suggesting maybe that 9P21 is more of a, uh, the risk loci is more of a gain of function uh, type of feedback. Okay. Now we wanted to get into what is the influence of uh, this knockout on ANRIL. So ANRIL is or CDKN2B antisense uh, 1 transcript, sometimes referred to as that. Uh, it's a long non-coding RNA. Um, function is not totally well characterized, but there's been some recent studies. I'm not sure if they've been published yet or not, actually, but recent studies looking at uh, long isoforms versus short isoforms of 9P21, and there seems to be a different influence of the different isoforms of NRO on uh, atherogenic type characteristics. So we wanted to look at how does our, our knockout uh, influence NRO expression. The knockout knocks out part of Anril. So that's shown down at the bottom. The basically between exons nine and ten is where one breakpoint of our knockout is, and then the, so the knockout removes exons ten and beyond, and then extends further uh, further down into a kind of regulatory region where there's no known genes or transcripts, uh, et cetera. And this table at the top shows you what what the different isoforms of ANRIL are and um, which exons are used in, uh, in which isoform. So we're going to be looking at expression of uh, different isoforms by looking at uh, primers where this kind of orangish bar is at exons 5 and 6. I don't know if you can see my mouse, but this orange bar at exons 5 and 6, this this will be interrogating basically uh, exons that are ubiquitously used in NREL. We have primers to this knockout uh, region. And actually, well, it's not shown here, but there's going to be a couple Looking at um, looking at uh, short isoform uh, expression as well with primers in this uh, region. So first, looking at what is it? What's the expression of ANRIL during uh, differentiation? Um, <coughs> and uh, so you see that with the knockout, obviously, there's no ANRIL expression when when we're looking at the, the, the primer that's further down, uh, exons 18, 19, the part that's knocked out. So you see no expression of the knockout region, obviously, since both exons have been removed, but kind of a control. And then you see that uh, during differentiation from uh, IPSCs to day 17, so day one is basically IPSCs, and day 17 is 
smooth, mature, smooth muscle cells. I don't know if I should say mature, maybe more like embryonic smooth muscle cells. Anyway, they're fully differentiated to smooth muscle cells. You see that anril comes on during uh, differentiation to smooth muscle cells, both in you know both in the risk risk and uh, non risk non risk uh, individual. Okay. Now, if you compare uh, expression of anril in the various lines that we have, uh, <coughs> the exons 19 and 20 obviously don't show up in the knockout, but uh, what you see here is the long isoform is more highly expressed, but uh, not significantly so, so maybe there's no uh, difference in, in expression at, at this point in time, day five. Uh, in the non-risk, non-risk uh, individuals. And then at day 17 in mature smooth muscle cells, you see that there's a diff significant increase in expression of the long isoform of anril in the non-risk, non-risk uh, individual. Then if you look at the ubiquitous exons, exons 5 and 6, that are used in all transcripts, you kind of see the opposite. So in this case, we can measure expression in the, in the knockout since these exons aren't removed. You have both in progenitors and in uh, fully differentiated smooth muscle cells an increase of this ubiquitous exon uh, in the risk-risk individuals where knockout of the risk-risk loci looks similar to non-risk, non-risk expression levels. And then similarly for the short uh, exon views in the short isoform, you see both in progenitor cells and in the mature smooth muscle cells that the risk-risk loci leads to an increase in expression of the short isoform, uh, whereas knockout of the risk-risk loci leads to an expression level that is similar to what is seen in the non-risk, non-risk uh, lines. Again, sort of indicating that the risk, risk loci is some kind of, has some kind of gain of function uh, activity where it leads to increased, um, increased expression of ANRIL, uh, even even relative to say, uh, we're not we're knocking it out versus non-risk non-risk are equivalent. Okay, and then um, looked at whether or not expression of anril correlates with CDKN two uh, B, and we find that it does. Uh, the especially the expression of the long isoform is correlated with uh, CDKN2B expression. You can see that here. See the long and, uh, well, sorry, the, 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 sh the short isoform, actually. So you see we have annual expression of the long isoform that increases in the non-risk, non-risk individual. The short isoforms uh, increase in the risk risk uh, individual, but then you see for CDKN 2B, you see an increase of CDKN 2B in the non risk non risk uh, individual. So long isoforms correlated with CDKN uh, 2B, which is consistent with the pro proliferation um, effect that we saw. So CDKN 2, 2B is a cell cycle inhibitor, so you have uh, uh, increased expression of CDKN2B in the non-risk, non-risk individuals and presumably in the knockout uh, as well, whereas the risk-risk individuals don't have increased expression of CDKN2B 
releasing whatever cell cycle inhibition is caused by CDK and DUB, and possibly that's what's causing the increase in, in uh, proliferation. All right, then we wanted to look at just uh, um, gene expression overall in these in these different lines. Um, this is a this is a heat map of expression at day three, so SMC progenitor cells, and day 17, mature smooth muscle cells, or close to mature smooth muscle uh, cells, and then iPSCs uh, as well. So you see that, as you'd expect, when you when you do RNA seq on these samples, they uh, cluster by um, cluster by sample by sample type. Now, if you look at differential expression, uh, here what's shown is the green again is non-risk, non-risk, red is risk, risk, and then the just the green outline would be the knockout of the non-risk, non-risk, and the red outline would be the uh, risk, risk uh, knockout. So if you compare uh, just wild type versus knockout in iPSCs, there's no change in expression uh, at all, no differential expression observed. At day three in these early mesoderm uh, progenitors, there's only one gene that shows up as differentially expressed when you do the knockout, and that's CDK and 2B. And then uh, at, in smooth muscle cells, 72 genes uh, differentially expressed. Uh, one of them being ANRIL, but there's no pathway kind of coherence to the differential expression when you look, when you compare knockout versus wild type um, differential expression. So just pure knockout doesn't seem to have a big impact on smooth muscle cells. But if you now consider what we've seen before in terms of the risk risk being a gain of function and do the appropriate uh, comparisons, you see something kind of interesting. So you see within the day 17, um, within the day 17 uh, kind of dendrogram here, if you look kind of carefully at the dendrogram, you'll notice that the risk risk knockout lines cluster with the non risk, non risk wild type and knockout lines whereas the risk-risk wild type uh, forms its own uh, separate cluster, and actually kind of similar to these mature uh, SMCs, risk-risk uh, SMCs. You look at a PCA as well, the risk-risk wild type uh, seems to be different than uh, the other three uh, types of lines, including risk-risk knockout. So when you look at that comparison, comparing risk, risk, knockout versus the other lines, I think what I said was the, sorry, risk, 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 wild type versus all other lines. So the red is risk, risk, wild type versus risk, risk, knockout, wild type, or non-risk, non-risk, wild type, and non-risk, non-risk, knockout. Look at differential expression there. In IPSCs, you see some differential expression, but no in enriched pathways. At day three early mesoderm cells, you see a large uh, number of differentially expressed genes, uh, uh, with cell adhesion being one of them, and then at, in smooth muscle cells, an even larger number of differentially expressed genes. So again, indicating that risk-risk wild type has some kind of gain-of-function type influence on gene expression uh, that trickles down to uh, other functions as well. And then finally, when we look at pathways, uh, pathway analysis in the risk-risk versus knockouts of risk-risk, non-risk, non-risk, and wild-type non-risk, non-risk, you see uh, these kind of coronary artery uh, disease relevant pathways differentially expressed, the big ones being kind of uh, cell adhesion, 
blood vessel, blood vessel development, proliferation, and uh, migration, etc. So in, in summary, it appears that the risk 9, 9p21 risk risk uh, 9p21 risk loci has a gain of function influence. Knockout of that risk loci is about the same as what you observe in individuals that are non-risk non-risk, either non-risk non-risk or knockout of the non-risk non-risk loci, and that this risk risk loci the gain of function uh, promotes pro-atherogenic. Uh, processes th such as proliferation of smooth muscle cells, differences in cell adhesion, uh, etc. So with that, I'll end and take any questions. The, this work is uh, done by myself, Eric Topol, and, and Evan Muse, a, a uh, junior faculty uh, member here, MD, PhD, cardiologist, uh, Pavel, graduate student and technical staff, and then the I IPSC uh, work is done by Kristen Baldwin uh, here at, at TSRI. Sure, this is the Andrew. I'll, I'll, I'll start. Uh, really cool presentation. Every time I see it, it's awesome. Okay, so uh, one question about the 9P21 boundary, right? How was that defined? I mean, was it just by, was there something that was um, that really made this boundary in the middle of, of ANRIL or was that more of a experimental um, you know more arbitrary choice yeah I know it's the so the it's it's where the linkage um, block or the haplotype block for the 9p21 loci and so you have at between exons 9 and 10 and then down to uh, the end of the haplotype block, there's there's another block that starts after that that's actually uh, involved in in diabetes risk. So, but basically we we define it based on the linkage uh, the linkage region where the linkage region for 9p21 starts and ends. And there's also um, when you look at uh, like enhancer data, for example it also seems to correlate with uh, starting and ending uh, within, within that kind of boundary. Got it. Uh, another question. So um, just to clarify, the was it true that uh, all of the risk-risk um, individuals came from gene heart and all of the non-risk non-risks came from elderly? And were uh, yeah, that's right. No, that for were there well, that were risk risk and or gene heart that were non risk non risk. No, we haven't. Uh, that's what we would uh, do. You know, later, but at this point, it's kind of extreme. Yeah. So the risk, the risk risk are gene heart. The non risk non risk are uh, well done. Do they exist though? Yes. Yeah. We ha we have we have homozygous risk uh, elderly individuals, for example. Or, or the opposite, non-risk, non-risk gene heart individual. And then maybe I have just one last question in terms of how you envision this reference resource looking. Um, so, so, so you mentioned right. So the IPSC is differentiation, RNA seq, and proteomics. Um, uh, so, do you, do you think that should in, would include the gene heart? Risk, risk ones. I mean, is, would that? I'm just trying to envision how other people outside of our center would would interact with um, uh, these data. What would be useful to the community? Yeah, I mean, we certainly could include gene heart individuals. The the reason why I'm suggesting elderly only is because it's it's not. Uh, it, I'm not thinking of it as a 9p21. Resource, you know, I'm thinking of it as a just genetics and expression and proteomics uh, resource. So the elderly are the only ones that have whole genome sequencing uh, data. So you'd, you'd be coupling all their genetic data with expression and proteomics in in smooth muscle cells derived from those individuals. 
So it'd be a glo you know to do global searches, not not nine p twenty one specific searches. We do we do have um, we do have genotyping data on the gene heart individuals. I believe that was done before, or I wasn't involved in that, so I have to find it sort of type of thing. But there is genotyping data available on them as well. Got it. But what would you say actually makes makes sense? Uh, so, so really, we pitch it as sort of the normal uh, uh, RNA and protein expression atlas for cells of cardiac uh, cor relevant to coronary artery disease. Yeah, that's right. So then you could query for any any GWAS SNP, for example, and see what 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 genes, expression levels, or protein levels are are altered in, say, smooth muscle cells. Based on, uh, you know, by by kind of dividing the Welderly cohort based on their genetics at whatever the query marker is, uh, and, and see what genes are influenced. Got it. And then I'm relating back to your comment about GTEx, GTEx not having some of these tissues of interest. What would you think then about comparing those RNA seq data relative to, to, to GTEx RNA seq data? I think that's a yeah. If we can get, um, I guess we just have to be careful and ensure we do the RNA seq in the same way that they do it. And uh, other than that, I think it's yeah. As, as long as we can normalize the data, I think it's a great idea. Uh, hi, Ali. This is uh, David from UCLA. I uh, I got a question. I got more a general, basic question about the model. Um, yep. I was wondering in what way, um, you know, all these cell lines, they're, they're actually processed from individuals. So do you think it's possible uh, that the demographic data from the individuals, their life habits or environmental factors, if they can actually affect your whole genome sequencing data? And if so, do you have this information still available? Can, they, can it be retrieved? We have some demographic data. We have... Um, Things like alcohol use, uh, uh, smoking, uh, we've computed ethnicity, for example. It's not a, it's not a, you know, height, weight, etc. The kind of stuff that I showed. We have that. Uh, I don't think it would. Um, uh, in terms of the RNA seq data, I don't think it would have an, a real impact uh, on it. Because when you so we've we've done this looking at you know there's these methods for uh, determining biological age using methylation data for example and if you look at uh, iPSCs generated from older or younger individuals uh, basically the the signatures of age are uh, for example for the most part eliminated uh, upon reprogramming. So everything goes back to a ground, uh, ground state. So there, there's probably there's still probably some in influence on, you know, the, the the donor at at the time that cells were donated. I'm sure there's some some influence on iPSCs and the resultant uh, smooth muscle cells, but it doesn't seem to be a major uh, influence anyways. Uh, but yeah, we we have the demographic. Information, so that could just be another way to uh, enable queries. Oh, okay, thanks. 